Welcome to the lighter side of the dark side. It's your weekly freak show here on uh, Renegade Radio, Steel Waves Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, Castbox, all the places that you listen to podcasts. It's a Dark Mark show. I'm Dark Mark, the goth comedian, and uh, returning this week. And I'm glad to have her, although she's not going to be on camera again. She's she's always the best looking person on the show and hates to show herself. But uh, not everybody's best favorite. Hello. <laughs> No, no, except for this show. Uh, everybody's favorite vegan heavy metal DJ, Hannah Bach. Hey, guys. <laughs> and Hannah, you will acknowledge you're the second best looking person on this show. I'm okay with that. You're okay <laughs> with that. Because the first best looking show person on the show, taking your crown for a change, is my friend, great comedian. I've known him, uh, I've only known him for about five years. I remember when I met you and we're going to talk about that. But he just came out and wrote a book. And it's already one of the top bestsellers in the self, uh, self-improvement self on Amazon. It's The Art of Being Yay, the man that lights up a room every time he walks in with his big smile and infectious laugh, Aiden Park. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> and uh, you do look better than me, okay? So I'm just... Oh, no, <laughs> just I don't. Just <laughs> well, You're the one wearing a Cruel Intentions t-shirt, so you win today. Yes, oh, my yes. God. This was $7 at Target. See, that's the thing. When you're your size, you can get things like that. I, when you're my size, I got this This uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space shirt was not $7, but uh, it's it, it's still fine. Anyway, uh, Aiden, besides your book, which we're going to we're gonna uh, plug mercilessly, and I recommend everybody get this, we have, a, we have a lot of people that, I mean, there's a lot of people everywhere that need some positive reinforcement, and you're the guy to give it to them. Not me. You're the guy to give it to him. The most yep. negative person in comedy is going to interview the most positive person in comedy. <laughs> You're hardly the most negative person in comedy. No, I know. I know. I know. Really? <laughs> people, say, people say I got to drop the goth thing because I'm, I'm too positive. But, uh, yeah, it's really and, positive. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah. But uh, we, I, I, we have sponsors. We have a lot of sponsors really quick. Audible is one of our sponsors. You don't have a – your book's not on Audible yet, but uh, – It is. Please. It is. It's submitted. So we're just waiting for it to get caught up. Okay. Well, it's going to be on Audible. So when you when you find out that that uh, Aiden's book is on Audible, go to audibletrial.com forward slash DMS, and you'll get a free – and also a free Audible original. And one yeah. of the Audible originals that everybody's raving about is the um, – the audible uh, uh, the version of the Sandman uh, that Neil Gaiman wrote and that he uh, he narrates and James McAvoy plays Dream. Everybody's going crazy for that. You can get two books, two Audible originals, one book and one Audible original. Get Aiden's book when it goes, goes on Audible. I, I know I will. But use okay. my code with audibletrial.com forward slash DMS so he and I both get paid. Awesome. <laughs> and and uh, uh, Aiden, are you vegan by, by chance? I am not vegan. Okay. I still got to take you to Doomy's Home Cooking, whether you're vegan or not. Mm-hmm. The best vegan food in LA. Hannah will tell you all about it. Oh, yeah. They have um, their own version of the Big Mac. They have jalapeno oh. poppers, cake, shrimp pole boys, which Mark likes, mm-hmm. um, spicy chicken sandwiches, fun fries. And they have uh, Nexmex, which is their um, Mexican vegan food. And they have flatas and... Best nachos. They were voted best nachos in what, 2019, 18? Support your restaurants, especially Doomy's Home Cooking. 12 to 53 Vine Street, uh, right where the M Bar used to be, right in that parking lot. I'm actually going tomorrow. We're gonna, I'm going to take uh, my former co host, Nic- Nicole Six. We're going to discuss a, a script that we're working on and get some delicious food, uh, maybe some chicken parmesan, maybe uh, flautas. I don't know. But uh, Doomy's Home Cooking. And uh, real quick, uh, uh, we are sponsored by Hustler Hollywood. Oh, really? Yes. I figured that would perk you up, Aiden. So. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's, there'll be a code in this. And if, if you're watching this on YouTube or listening to this on the podcast catcher, uh, go to the comments because there's going to be a code there for 20% off whatever you want. Lingerie, uh, butt plugs, dildos, lube, whatever, whatever, whatever you want. Uh, and they got good clothes. Uh, and just 20% off. And you get a free gift. Free naughty gift. And Spy Associates, another sponsor of ours, you also get 20% off uh, with, this, with our code, over any order over $249. They have cameras that you can put in your smoke detectors, GPS trackers, bug detectors, 
spy on somebody or find out somebody's spying on you. Go to Spy Associates. All sorts of James Bond kind of shit. And the last sponsor, it's it, it's going crazy. One every network and every sponsor. Ray's Energy Drink, R A Z E, my favorite energy drink. I love this stuff. This is not the Seven Eleven crap, the Red Bull. This is stuff you get at like GNC and gyms. Zero calories, zero crash, zero. No, zero, I messed it up. Zero calories, zero carbs, zero crash. I got a 12 pack of Galaxy Burst and you can too, 15% off. This kind of tastes like Fruit Loops. Ooh. Delicious. Okay. Ooh, I wish I had one of those right now. Huh. I'll, I'll ship one to you. So, you. but then again, go to our code, you get 15% off. These are, I'm telling you, not only do these, do these taste great, and they have sour gummy worms, they have other flavors. Uh, Baja Lime that tastes like Baja Blast at the, the Taco Bell. But like I say, th this really perks you up. And <laughs> no crap. Yeah. Like I need but to I be more, know. right? <laughs> but I uh, have to match Aiden's energy tonight, which is going to be a hard task, as you can see already. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah said, have, have seen you. Hannah saw you a couple years ago when we both performed at Angie Crumb's roast. Right. Yeah. Right. And I, uh, I said something about uh, trying to uh, figure out the diameter of your anus, but uh, that was, you know, it's a roast. That's kind of the things that we say. Oh, it depends on the day. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Yeah. That's but the right. first time I met you was at uh, Tuesday Thomas's show at the Clown House. That's right. Five years ago, right, right before I left for New Orleans, I did a show, and we yeah. both performed. I was like, wow, this guy's great. Oh, and thank you. We talked after the show, and you were super nice. Yeah, nice I was. <laughs> yeah, what happened? What do you mean? I'm kidding. No, you're still nice, of course. I'm still nice, yeah. I don't know if I was – I was kind of green back then. I think I was, like, maybe three years in, so I wasn't sure how my comedy was. <laughs> well, I think you but, just came from San um, Francisco. Is that correct? Like 2015? Oh, I moved down here in 2009. So okay. I'd been there for a while, but I started comedy down – and I was about three years in when I met you. Okay. And, uh, and so, Hannah, let, let me give, go through the whole story. Okay. It's quite a story. And it's amazing. This is what's great about your book. Is that it's amazing after all the things that have happened to you that you are still positive and you're teaching people how to be positive. And I, you really need to teach us how to, how to be yay because we, we, need, we need the yay in our life. Yeah, we do. Okay. Oh, well, go to the hustler and get the biggest <laughs> butt plug you can, <laughs> and then measure your ass diameter. That's a good way to start, right? <laughs> you think I should start with the biggest, or should I start with the smallest and go? Oh, just go for the win. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, all right. So, and make sure you get lube with that when you uh, for twenty percent off. Do first. Do yes. So anyway, I was gonna do something with a galaxy can, but let's let's go let's go back with the yeah. So <laughs> you were born in Seoul, South Korea. Oh, yes, I was. What's it like growing up in Seoul, South Korea? I have no idea. Um, I mean, it's not that much different than here, except it is super hyper competitive from where, where, um, where I, you know, uh, they're very, um, all about like getting the grade and making sure you accomplish them, da 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 da, you know? The age uh, of stereotype. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> and Koreans, okay, we've suffered a lot. We really have. Like, there was the Japanese and the North Korean invasion. And so <laughs> Koreans are kind of effed up. <laughs> well, I was going to say, like, uh, you know, after all that, I mean, you, you hear about North Korea and, you know, you see Kim Jong-un and, and all that. But you don't hear a lot about, I mean, South Korea seems, uh, except for the Olympics, you don't hear a lot about them. Yeah. South Korea is interesting. Um, uh, so when there was the North Korea and South Korea split, South Korea kind of didn't have a culture of its own. So we adapted like whatever the Western, Western culture, you know? Right. So they are very heavily Baptist. They are very religious. And we're very, um, we want to be like the U.S. Because U.S. is kind of what, you know, thought like saved. At least this was the case in 1989 right. or 19 when I moved here, you know? And so uh, we adapted the value of the Western culture, for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, like when you were five years old, you got addicted to the Sister Act, the movie. Yeah, I did. That yeah. was a good movie. <laughs> you like Sister Act, and Hannah? When I was a little girl, yeah, because that was the only movie playing, you know, on our little TV that you'd turn the button thing, you know, the knob. 
Oh yeah, the, 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 the really? You yeah, had one of the, that one. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of similarities between Seoul, Korea, and Kitchikan, and Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, you're from Alaska, so I guess she she sort of had the same thing. Just the uh, mm-hmm. had to turn the TV with a knob and watch Sister Act. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're from Alaska, Hannah. Yeah. Okay, cool. It's like my mom lives in Alaska right now, actually. Oh, what part? Yeah, Fairbanks. Fairbanks, okay. I lived there for a little bit when I was really tiny. I'm from Ketchikan, which is another little island. Oh my God. I'm <laughs> because my favorite singer is Jewel. <laughs> and so I listened to her a biography, Never, what is it called? Like, Never Broken. And she's <laughs> been stuff. And oh, so yeah. I love Van. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, she, so uh, uh, well, here's a whole. This goes around, and you know, here's the six degrees of separation. Jewel, I used to, uh, my first job when I was in college, I, I was a host at Denny's. And Jewel, before she was famous, would go in the bathroom and use the bathroom to change at that Denny's. Oh, oh my wow. God. Wow. Cool. So when I was like 16, I met Jewel before she was famous. Was that in that area? Where was it? In Pacific Beach. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, she used to, she. Well, I love Jewel. Jewel's great. She's, mm-hmm. she's great. I mean, she was she was nice then, and uh, you know, I remember, uh, you know, when she blew up, and after she blew up, uh, and then she's reinvented herself so many times. Yeah. Well, she, the she first time out. she heard herself on the radio, she cried because she thought she sounded like Kermit the Frog. Oh, sir, you're so <laughs> exactly. I, I listen to her all the time. I find that she's very. Um, very spiritual and it's very um I don't know, I love listening to her. It calms me down. I love it. I really do. Okay. Good song. What's that? I'm sorry? Foolish Games. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so if you get a little too manic, we'll start singing Foolish Games and uh, calm me down. <laughs> and, so. I know all the so I'm ready. But what was it about Sister Act that really resonated with you as a five year old kid? Okay, so what, what what happened was uh, my mom and I, uh, my mom had a video store, and we lived in the back of the video store, right? We lived there. Oh, wow. And I had, like, I was playing with a friend, and he had to leave, and I was really sad as a five-year-old, and I was, like, just sobbing, you know? I was really sad. Mm-hmm. And my mom played Sister Act on TV, and she was just watching these singing, dancing nuns, and I remember when I saw that, I stopped crying and I got so involved into the movie and I just sat there quietly through the whole thing and it became my favorite movie. So I watched that movie over and over and over and I wore the tape out. And uh, it was such a comforting movie for me, you know? Did you dress Uh, as a nun and sing and dance and do the whole thing or? (laughs) No, but um, I do do remember having a black towel that I would throw over my head, pretending like one of the nuns. That's yeah, a, you don't have any pictures, do you? That, I, that, I'd put that in the book if I was you. Uh, I, I forgot about that until now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now, now we'll have to, to pull all the all the copies off the shelf. Yeah, redo them and then bring yeah. So. And redo it. Damn yeah. it. Damn it. Yeah. So so uh, so you moved when you were uh, uh, in, in your early teens. No, I moved to the United States when I was nine years old. Oh, nine I'm years old. Wait, wait, just so you know, I'm, I like sitting like this because I'm a weirdo. But uh, I am wearing oh. shorts, so everybody. That too, it's okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. I just, uh, you know, it just, uh, I wasn't sure if that was your leg or your dick, but I was trying to figure oh, it out. Oh, well, <laughs> aren't I lucky? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, sit, sit however you like. I don't care. But uh, uh, the more relaxed, the better. But uh, so uh, why did your parents move to the United States when you were nine? There was a specific incident that happened. Uh, my mom always wanted to kind of move, but uh, uh, this is in the book. I was actually playing in my neighborhood and there was a kid, right? And I went up to him and he kind of like ignored me. He uh, pretended like he didn't see me. And I was like, hey, hello. And he was like, I'm not allowed to talk to you anymore. And I said, why? And he goes, because my dad told me that uh, you don't have a dad and that's the reason why you act like that. And so I ran home crying to my mom, mm. told her about what happened. And my mom was like, what? And so she got up and she went right to the store where the dad worked, the dad of the kid, right? Right. 
And she came back 15 minutes later. She was like, that's it. We're moving to the United States. Pack your bags. We're going right now. We're going to go. We're going. Wow. I mean, it wasn't right then, but she told me, she announced that we were going. Mm -hmm. so, um, she, in Korea, there's a really strong, um, like, sexism. There's a lot of just open uh, discrimination for class. And just, I mean, this was back in the 90s, though, so... So was was this a class thing or, or a gay thing or what? It was both. A uh, right. single mother, um, right. you know, and also I was a quirky kid. And, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of money. And so uh, it was a combination of all three, I think. Yeah. And, and by the way, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you're a quirky adult as well. I know. <laughs> I'm really yeah, a quirky kid, but I grew out of it. No, you didn't grow out of it. That's the way you no. are. It's great. We love it. It is. I embraced it. I can't. I don't know. I'm a weirdo. What can I you're say? Being, you're being yay. Yeah. <laughs> so you moved to, I was it San Francisco initially or? Yes, we moved to San Francisco. And uh, growing up in the video store. I'm sorry? What was it like growing up in the video store? I used to work at one when I was a teenager and I just have so many fun memories. Oh, it was so fun. I was such a big fan of movies when I was like six, seven, eight, right? Uh-huh. And like we we slept in the back room of the video store. And so we had, you know, we had all these videos and we had this great thing where um, if they rent two, we could recommend the third one. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I was so proud of our video store and I knew all of the movies by heart. Like Aww. I knew what the I knew what categories of if Dark Mark came in. I would know what to give him, you know, mm -hmm. movies yeah, ever, you know. And I knew each of my customers and they loved me and I loved them. And I would literally watch the store as a six, seven, eight year old while my mom would take a nap in the back or get some food or run errands. And it was that kind of time. And um, mm -hmm. I, it, was, it was so much fun. It, w it really was. Yeah. It was yeah. I gotta tell you, I worked at a video store as well and uh, it's the best job. I, yeah. I did the video the store, it's such a fun job. Absolutely. Could, Didn't pay anything, anything, but it was, yeah, I didn't pay anything, but it was fun. Free rentals and back when VHS was around and you could watch mm -hmm. so many movies. So it was fun. Really, but like you say, it's good to uh, know what somebody likes and recommend somebody something. Mm -hmm. I worked in a combination record and video store and uh, yeah, I would play uh, I would play some weird music and uh, people would just be like, I want that. And, 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 uh, and then, you know, like you say, I would know if somebody came up and they had something that I knew they wouldn't like, I'm like, you're not going to like this. You try this yeah. one. Yeah, totally. I was like a video reviewer too. Like I would like, you know, uh, the big movie uh, franchise that was big back then was Chucky. Um, mm -hmm. My mom would let me watch these horror movies. Like we didn't think anything of it. So I would watch all the, I, mean, yeah. I had like some anxiety uh, <laughs> issues, uh, which might have been as a result of that. But um, Chucky was big, right? So mm -hmm. we had Chucky 1, Chucky 2, and I remember Chucky 3 coming out and everybody being so excited about us getting <laughs> Chucky 3. And it was such a disappointment. Do you remember Chucky 3? Was that the one in military school or was that 4? Right. It was no. bull crap. It was terrible. <laughs> and so, you know, it was very disappointing to have to explain to everybody, Chucky 3 is really not that great. And everybody going, okay, well, I want to see it anyway, taking it and coming back. Yeah, Chucky 3 was not that great. I was like, I know, isn't it disappointing? So we had a camaraderie over the terribleness of Chucky 3. <laughs> At least you prepared everybody for the suckiness of Chucky 3. Oh, my God. It so was some other people would be like, oh, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, you tell me. But you're like, yeah, no, it sucks. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anna, which one was that? The, the one here in military school, right? Oh, the military school one. Yeah, that one stinks. Horrible. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then Bride and Chucky got it back, but uh, it took a while. I mean, yeah. it's not as bad as the latest one. I didn't like that. It was just weird. It wasn't Charles Lee Ray. <laughs> well, I haven't seen the latest one. Mm -hmm. yeah. I keep going to watch it, and I was like, no. I don't, okay. I don't watch movies a lot now. Mm -hmm. I'll movie it yeah. out. I'm all movie out. <laughs> so anyway, so, so you go to San Francisco, and uh, a better environment, I would think? No. Or people, or even worse. It was, it was, it was um, an incredibly traumatizing experience for me, moving to San Francisco. How so? How so? Uh, 
there was a bunch of situations. So when we moved to the United States, my mom brought me without a, a uh, visa. So we came as undocumented immigrants, right? Mm. And we came here and- oh, wait, wait, There's the uh, ice is coming to get you, by the way. Oh, well, great, I'm a citizen yeah, now, siren, so. so yeah. <laughs> So you're, so you're, you're, you're undocumented. Yeah. But um, I was brought here undocumented. And first of all, um, I, don't, I don't even know where to start. In Korea, I was um, well-liked at school. I was at the top of my class. I was, um, you know, I was with my mom all the time, right? So yeah. I had, a, you know, a good emotional support. And... Um, we moved to the United States and all of a sudden I can't speak the language. The kids don't understand. And I was fat in Korea, but like, I, I never thought that it was a problem until I came to the States and then they made, started making fun of me for being a fat kid. And I didn't know that I was, I was such a fat kid. Um, and so I had no friends all of a sudden and I was all of a sudden terrible at school and I couldn't communicate. And the way I connected with people, even back in Korea, was through humor and jokes and, you know, creating camaraderie in that way. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have that. So I was very much alone at school. Back at home, my mom found a boyfriend. Um, and she was hardly around. So I was left with my grandmother, who was a kitchen helper for a Korean restaurant at the time. And so I was home alone a lot. So I would go to school, not be able to communicate, not be able to get frustrated because I couldn't learn. I would come home and be alone. Um, and so I went from being around people all the time to being around no one. Right. Uh, uh, isolated then, in a room full of people to being isolated by yourself. Right. It was, it was, a, it was really tough. And, uh, and then the, the situation got even more complicated when my mom the boyfriend that she had got into dental school across the country. And she, she, she was gonna say goodbye to him and stay with me, but he threatened her. He said, if you don't come with me, I will report you and your kid to the INS, so you're coming with me, whether you like it or not. Wow. Uh, so what she went, guy. sorry? So what a lovely guy. Yeah, he's, he's, um, he's a, the charm. So she went with him. Um, and of course she, she still loved him and she still loved her. It was more complicated than that, but that was definitely part of the equation. Right. Um, and so I was left with my grandmother, who didn't speak any English, in her senior government apartment, um, which poses problems. I'm not allowed to be there. I'm mm -hmm. an undocumented immigrant, still having language problems, almost flunking out of school, having very little friends. I felt bad about my body, and I felt very isolated. So it was a very tough time. Uh, ha, 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 sorry to bring everybody down. <laughs> yeah, Hannah, stop crying. Now, how did you get through that? Poorly. <laughs> really? You don't want to think about it now. <laughs> yeah, it was tough. It was bad. Oh. Yeah. Was it, was it, was musical theater the thing that saved you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that I want to address is the whole gay thing. So I'm hitting puberty, right? Oh, by the way, yeah, people, Gaden's gay. I don't know if he caught that yet. Right. Surprise, in case somebody's yeah. saying, oh, yeah. I hope he, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah you, so, don't have to, you don't even have to say you're gay. You just have to laugh and we get it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> laugh like SpongeBob SquarePants. I look like him too, yellow and full of large holes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I hit puberty and again, that was another layer, like the whole God thing and the whole, you know. Right. Um, so I, you know, I, I was suffering pretty badly until about 15 years old, you know, um, until I did musical theater at, at school. I auditioned for something, um, and I got the part in the chorus and it made me feel like I was a part of something, anything, and it made me feel like I had some kind of worth, uh, and so it kind of, it did kind of save me. It gave me something to look at that I felt um, excited about. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the true story of Sister Act. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it, was, it was. It saved my life, I would say. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. oh, but, but, uh, but wouldn't uh, being in San Francisco as a young gay man probably be, wouldn't that be the right place or no? It was not, um, because uh, this was back in 2000, 2001, uh, mm -hmm. 1999. And so uh, it, it, 
even though it was in San Francisco, in school, it was still okay to pick on gay kids, right? It was like, it was an inner city San Francisco. It was not, wow. San, it was inner city San Francisco where it's okay to just call p kids a fag and you're fat and... I, was, I, people call me all, all of that. Yeah. No, seriously, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not joking. And obviously, you, I'm sure you got it much worse than I did, but I've been called a fag for many reasons. No. When I was a kid, I, 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 I was called, I, I, somebody literally said, because I like Doctor Who, I was a fag. Yeah. And it's but like, I, I act like this, right? And now like, people like yeah. Doctor Who. So it was pretty obvious that I was gay. And then I, I didn't want to be gay, so I'd be like, no, I'm not, even though I knew I was, which just made it worse, right? <laughs> and by the way, uh, I'm just, I'm quoting, should I have not have said that word? Because I know it's on your back. Oh, uh, you mean the, the bag word? Yeah. You say whatever I you want. I got you your yay, and I didn't mean to do that. At, you know, YouTube haters, but I'm not going to give you a hard time about it. Okay, I'm just quoting, so, and that's the last time I'll say that, because I, I know, like, uh, your face kind of, but I mean, you know, you, oh, no, you know no, that, no. It's, it's a hurtful <laughs> word. Sorry. Anyways, it's, you've been called that, and it's a hurtful word. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a hurtful word. <laughs> but anyway, so, and also, uh, so, so this wasn't the place to have your sexual awakening as a young man. It, it was. It became damaging later on. Um, <laughs> wow, we're getting real into detail. Um, and I cover all this in my book, by the way. Yeah, okay. I, 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 you know, like I said, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to, I just, I don't want, I don't want you to read your book, but I'm just, these are all things that I found out about you that are cur curious. Yeah. We even saw a YouTube video of you singing uh, More Than a Feeling by Boston, which took me I know. Surprise. I'm a good singer. You are a good singer. Hannah, I'm going to forward that to you. He's dancing oh. that song. I, but that seems like an odd choice, though. It was just something I was doing. <laughs> I love it. I love those uh, classic rock things. <laughs> you know, you know, what are you going to do? I love karaoke. I do. Uh, I, yeah, that, we were just talking about that. I, I, I get invited to karaoke all the time, and my ex-girlfriend, I'm a karaoke widow. Uh, like She used to go to karaoke far too much, and I just got burned out on it, but oh. I can't sing like you. So, Oh, well, thank you. Huh? Anyway, so uh, so you were you were in musical theater, and uh, is that uh, was uh, Jeremy Lin the musical? Was that the, your first like? Was that a real professional production? Or? That was later. That was way later. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So and I guess I, we did do that. We did put that together, uh, and I did play Jeremy Lin. Right. <laughs> and I do have a joke. I mean, I look like a, I'm like a 17 year old girl trapped in an Asian basketball player's body. I'm very tall, um, but I can't sure. bounce balls. I can only bounce balls this way. <laughs> Hannah, if you don't know, Jeremy Lin is a uh, he's a Asian basketball player. Okay. And okay. he's very good and probably the most successful Asian basketball player that's ever been in the NBA. Yao Ming is pretty good. I forgot about Yao Ming. You're right, but uh, those oh. are the two. Yeah. Oh. So Aiden did a musical about Jeremy Lin, which uh, I don't. Uh, that's who who went to see that? It was a lot of basketball fans, or it was just uh, a lot of Asians. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine so. Uh, yeah. So, so you were doing musical theater for a while, right? Yes. And, and uh, yeah. So, when you graduated high school, you just went into the theater, or no? Actually, that's where things really fell apart. <laughs> if things could get worse, I, I, I really get to the, the most negative parts of your life right away. Are, I mean, did you? Okay, so did you read my bio, and are you guiding this, or are you? Are we just hitting upon these things uh, just chronologically by accident? I'm trying to. I'm trying to go chronologically as like as much as I can. Oh my God. Okay, so um, well, I do a lot of research on you. Don't worry about it. I, I found the nude pictures and everything. Oh, awesome! Great. They're all over the place. <laughs> Anna, are we bumming you out? No, I'm listening. I'm. I'm well, good. This has a happy ending. Trust me. Don't worry about this. Well. Okay, so I mean, and I'm very open. I'm gonna, I'm open about this. So uh, when I was 15 and I started musical theater, I met other people. So I lined up way with the whole gay culture, and I started being very, uh, very promiscuous in San Francisco. That's when I started hooking up with older guys and mm -hmm. online, you know, through gay.com and all that. Um, I graduated high school, and up until that point, I didn't know that I was undocumented, right? So I got into colleges. And then I, the way I found out I couldn't go was I was up for a scholarship to Berkeley. 
And they pulled me aside and asked for my, you know, citizenship ID or whatever. And I told them I didn't have it. And I found out that way I got pulled. So then I got into all these schools and couldn't accept because at that time there were no protections for undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. So it would mean I would have to come up with $200, $300 a year to go to these schools, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And that wasn't going to be possible. So I didn't. And then I found out that I couldn't get jobs <laughs> because right. yeah, you don't have And so I became a Craigslist hooker. <laughs> yeah, when, when those things were, were saying, yeah. It was those things, erotic services on Craigslist. Yeah. Um, and that was really kind of okay. Like, I mean, I didn't think anything of it. I, I you know, at the time it felt like it made sense. I needed to make money and, you know. When you show up at a guy's door, they don't check for documentation. No. <laughs> In fact, um, I hooked up with some like very conservative politicians. Uh, what a surprise! Right? Isn't that crazy? Um, no, I mean that's 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 always the, uh, the the stereotype that they're just like you know I'm not I'm against gay rights I'm against gay rights and then you know five years later it turned out to be gay. Yeah, it, for it's sure. Like so many of them. I mean, seriously, I ended up at his house and there was like, he was like, keep quiet. I still live with my family and my mother lives upstairs. So it was like an in-law. So he was like, please keep quiet. And, uh, you know, afterwards he literally, you know, was praying and I was like, well, you're still on your knees. So it's convenient. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a second. Wait a second. You had, you, you did the sexual things with a man and then he started praying. Yeah. There was that one time where he did pray. Yes. Anna, has that ever happened to you? No, not the praying, the screaming God part, yeah. Yeah, I've had people... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had people say, oh, Jesus, oh, God. I've had people cry, but I've never had people start praying. Yeah, yeah, he prayed. Yeah. That's a, that, that must be a good blowjob or whatever you did for him. Oh, I was good. I was good. <laughs> I'll bet My that- grace was that these men would uh, fall in love with me. Um, and so I didn't have to have that many customers because they, I don't know why they just liked me. And so they were like, we don't, I don't want you on the street. They thought like Richard Gere, like they were like Richard Aww. Gere. And they, they were like, Roberts. let me rescue you. Yeah. And so I had a couple of those guys kind of helped me along. Um, yeah. So. But this is, but, but you were, all, you were, you were into the daddy thing already though. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was okay. Like it worked yeah. out for me. So, yeah. So when you see a, a young, good-looking guy, doesn't turn you on? No, not really. No. Okay. Yeah, I have a specific type. I do. Well, Hannah does too. Hannah likes older men too. So it's. Uh, yeah. And you know what's got a daddy type? Is I'm 35 now, right? Mm-hmm. And a white guy who looks, who's 35 actually looks way older than me, and so I can date my own age now. <laughs> So you sort of preserved yourself so you can date your own age. Yeah, Hannah, Hannah likes guys about uh, ten years older than her. Then, uh, mm, yeah, I'm I'm 36 and the, my boyfriend now he's 50. Great, perfect. I love yeah. older guys. They're great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's so What's so great about older guys? They know how to treat a woman, and they've already been through or anybody. They know how to treat them. They've already been through all the shit yeah. and cheating, and some like he already had his kids and raised them and. For the yeah. most part, what they want, and they're not afraid to say it. Exactly. Yeah, he scooped me up right away. Like within a month, he's like, "Be my girlfriend." Yeah, he's like, "Oh, this is this is you. That's it." Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very forward. Yeah. So how how did you why how and why did you transition from uh, musical comedy to uh, uh, musical yeah from musical comedy to stand up comedy? Um, I was doing stand. I was doing musical for several years. You know. And yeah. literally, I kept doing productions of Miss Saigon over and over and over and over. <laughs> and I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do any more productions of Miss Saigon. I did nine of them. Uh, and, uh, and Butterfly, I would imagine, too, right? Huh, no, I never did M Butterfly. I never did that. Hmm. Yeah. So you got sick of being Miss Saigon. I was sick of doing Miss Saigon. <laughs> and so I just wanted a different way to express myself. And so I did a stand-up comedy. I took a stand-up comedy class. Was that in LA or was that in San Francisco? Um, th- uh, that was uh, in LA, yes. Okay, and yeah. uh, since then you've uh, 
I mean, you're, you're all over. You've been, um, you, the, the, the main thing that, uh, that I applaud you for, you've done so many shows and you put on so many shows, but you produce Rainbow Pop. Yeah. The LTP, YA showcase at the Laugh Factory, and I've been to a few of those, and they're so much fun. Thank you. I'm really I proud take of you. I not to one of them, but to, uh, something happened that day. But once, hopefully when the stages come back and Rainbow Pop comes back, we'll mm -hmm. all be there, and uh, it'll be great. Yeah, we'll see. Anything could happen, you know. Well, how did Rainbow Pop, how did you get that going? I mean, was that already going and you became the host and producer, or is that something that you came up with? Um, oh, my God. <laughs> um, well, I'm sorry. I laugh at my own jokes. I think I'm hilarious, and sometimes I don't, yeah. even, I don't know what I'm laughing about, but I'm laughing, right? As long as you tell, just tell them, make us laugh, we, we're fine with it. Yeah, I was, I was a producer um, there. Um, I was in development at the Laugh Factory. Mm -hmm. um, for a while, and um, they had me co-produce a show down in Long Beach um, for a year, a solid year with no pay, doing guest spots, just um, mm -hmm. you know, doing producing, right, like um, for free. And um, then they gave me an opportunity to produce a show uh, that they wanted to expand to the Hollywood. So they put me in charge, and they said, "This is your show, and now you're passed at the Laugh Factory. Here you go." So um, essentially, it ended up like that. The Rainbow Pop was my idea. I liked the, it was initially called Comedy Realness. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, there was a booker change and the new booker insisted he wanted a new name. And I'm not gonna mention him, but he's an asshole. He told me that he, he was like, we're gonna, we're gonna name it something new. There was no problem with Comedy Realness. We already had a brand going, but essentially, right. you know, he wanted to just take credit or whatever. So he was like, let's change it. And I re recommended Rainbow Pop. And this is a straight white guy. And he was like, nah, it needs to be funny. It needs to, it's not rainbow soda. It needs to be funny. This freaking hipster. And then he said to me, he goes, I got some names for you, okay? How about crossing swords and bumping donuts? And I was like, I am not calling my LGBT show crossing swords and bumping donuts. So I'm going to go to that. What? And then I was like, no. And he was like, how about Rainbow Trout Theater? And I was like, you mean like fishy lesbians? Hell no. Um, and so Rainbow Pop it was because eventually the president had to step in and was like, it's going to be Rainbow Pop. We can't hold up the show because you can't decide on a name. And so that guy doesn't like me very much either because he got in trouble. Mm. It, was, it wasn't Jamie, was it? No, it was not Jamie. Okay. Hey, buddy, you got to do the show. It got to be the Rainbow Pop, man. I'm just waiting for you to say that the straight guy recommended something like you're taking up the ass comedy or something. That, those are horrible names that he came up with. Yeah, yeah. He thought he was being ironic. Um. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. But, but uh, I've, told, I've said this to Hannah. We've had a few. I think I, I said this when, when Mia Mars was on. I said this when Chang was on. But uh, And uh, Joey Gaynor and a few other people. But Life Factory is the best club, isn't it? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, well, I, mean, I think Laugh Factory is the best club. To me, of all the clubs in LA, and they're all great, and they all have their own idiosyncrasies, the Laugh Factory is set up to kill. I am biased because they really did give me my chance, and they really are my home club, and I, and I feel very much loyal to them. I, I have a lot of loyalty to the Laugh Factory. I love them very much. Um, it's kind of about the way the club is set up. If you bomb at the Laugh Factory, and you've been doing comedy more than six months or a year, get out because you just don't know what you're doing. There's no way you can bomb at the Laugh Factory. Oh, there are, though. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> well, I've seen it, but I've never, I, 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 in confident comics, I've never seen it. I, I've never bombed at the Laugh Factory, and I've never seen, I've never seen you bomb at the Laugh Factory, so. Yeah. Have I bombed at the Laugh Factory? I bombed at the Long Beach one. Okay, maybe, but, uh, but uh, but anyway, you don't bomb a lot because you you go on stage and you just have this infectious energy. Hannah remembers when she saw you a couple of years ago at the Van Nuys Comedy Club, which is not as good as the Laugh Factory, but it's okay. And uh, you just went up and you were just a ball of energy and a ball of fire. I remember I was sitting with Hannah and her friends, and they and they were just loving you. Yeah, we loved you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no. We were praising you, Hayden, and saying how funny you were. Mm hmm Go ahead, Hannah. Praise him some more. No, you are. You are. You're adorable, and especially talking to you now, I just can't be sad around your 
presence, it seems like. You'd be the perfect well, person to, like, live with, too. So it's like every morning you wake up and you're like, yay! <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hannah wants to move in with you. Great. <laughs> Please do. I'm lonely. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I was going to say, that's a good segue to your book, which is The Art of Being Yay. Now, there's a lot of power positive thinking books, a lot of law of attraction books. What makes your book different? Um, it's from personal experience. I'm, I put it all out there. So the reason why my book is different on the empowerment level is because, um, you know how I told you I was, a, I was a prostitute for a minute there, right? How could I forget? I actually stopped because um, I ended up getting HIV. And um, from that point, I was at such a low. That's when a friend of mine stepped in and sent me to an empowerment workshop. Mm -hmm. And that was the only way that I knew to educate myself. When I went, it changed my life. And so what I've been doing since then for 15 years, right, is studying empowerment concepts. But I didn't tell anybody because I didn't right. want people to know what I was doing. So I was studying neuro-linguistic programming and, you know, concepts, uh, empowerment concepts from like landmark studying successful people, modeling um, and getting mentored by really successful guys. Um, and so I was applying all of that to the career of comedy and how I can use it to my advantage. Um, and so that, and so I am actually living proof, actually, you know, it, it, like a lot of empowerment books can be theory right? Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like I really did start at a place where I was HIV positive, couldn't go to college, undocumented, here I was, and I layer by layer learned how to apply the tools that I talk about in the book to my life to achieve results, and here are the results, right? So right. putting it all out there, like I was HIV positive, I, w I went through this and this and this and this and this, I will put it right there, I have no shame about it, and I'm sharing on that level, which I don't think that a lot of empowerment books have behind them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a bunch of entitled white guys. Meanwhile. Well, we don't, we, I don't know that, but people tend to be afraid to share too much about them. And the, with the empowerment book, I find that there's sometimes a, 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 a veneer of pristineness around the person as if they figured oh. it out, right? They're the gurus. And I have no interest in doing that. I want to just say how it was, tell you what worked, tell you what didn't work. And here's the evidence is I applied it to my personal life and here I am, right? Mm -hmm. I can't I think of anything. Go ahead, Hannah, I'm sorry. Oh, I said I definitely need to read your book. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty I, open. I, I, well, I, yeah, I'll, get, I'll get it for you, Hannah. We'll definitely, uh, we'll definitely both get, uh, get, get books. Uh, I, definitely yeah. wanna, I definitely wanna read it, but I mean, I can't think of anything more crushing than a diagnosis of getting HIV. Oh, and you were, uh, like in your early twenties. Losing your lover is is more crushing than the diagnosis of HIV. Yeah, I I was I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that because I met I met Michael. He was a great guy. Well, that that's the, what the book's about, right? So yeah, this is where the, the the book is. So for the first between I was nineteen and thirty three. Mm -hmm. I was applying the tools I was learning, um, and I, my, my focus is in neuro-linguistic programming. Actually, I'm a master practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming, mm -hmm. only for the purpose of using it for myself. I didn't mean to do it to coach anybody else, okay? I only wanted to coach myself. You can use it on yourself. Well, let me, let me ask you a question before you get into that. Yeah. Is that something you use to write jokes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, I got to figure out how to do that. That's, 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 that's interesting. Absolutely. There are so many ways to um, work. Like the, the, the best advice that I would have for anybody who wants to get into stand-up comedy is you've got to build rapport with your audience right. in order for them to ride with you. If you do not have a rapport with them, then things will not work, even if your joke is the most brilliant ever. It just will not. So I made it a priority to make sure if I step on stage, my priority number one is make that rapport, make rapport with the audience. And there are way, specific ways to do that. And if you know how to read body language, right? If you know how to read the room, through some of the tactics that I learned in neurolinguistic programming, I can pick out what points will have the biggest impact 
to create mm -hmm. that rapport, right? Yeah. Um, and so I was doing stuff like that. Also, I was using it for business, like sales, sales tactics, like figuring out what does this person, what is important to this person as far as what they want to do and how can I bring that to them so that I can get them to make the purchase. Right. Like give me a comedy show or, you know, sell a comedy show or like how can I use what I know to move myself forward sales wise, performance wise, everything. And it's, it's so such an incredible tool that I'm, I'm so behind it. I'm so behind I, it. Yeah, the, the second part is what I really need help on. But Hannah, you know what he was saying about getting people's attention when you get on stage? Mm -hmm. Remember when uh, we had Shang on and we had Tom Dreesen on and they said the same thing? Yeah, mm -hmm. they did. So. And I've never heard them, so. <laughs> I mean, I know them, but I've they're never two, they, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're two of the best. They're and, great uh, guys, yeah. You never met Shang or Tom Dreesen? You, uh, Me? No, yeah. I've met him. I, Shane's, a, Shane's a friend of mine. But I we thought never so, yeah. Concept. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, they're uh, kind of saying that, that you have to, you have to get the crowd's attention. And uh, yeah, and you're right. Absolutely. So for 14 years, I used this for tangible results, right? Audience or business results or sales or what have you. After Michael died, I became so miserable, like suicidal. Like, I really love that guy. Mark, you uh, met him. Like, we... I met him, and I, I, I remember seeing you uh, shortly after uh, he passed away, and it wasn't the same age, and you were... I mean, you were holding up a good front, but uh, you could tell it wasn't... You didn't have the A. I was, I was not happy. I was, I was... It was such... It's all in the book, but it, it was such a, a disturbing... When you find out your partner has cancer and you love him that I, I would, I would have done anything. I would have died. I wish I would have died. Like, yeah. and I still do Aww. instead of him. Um, but Hannah, let me, uh, let me go back to the, to the good times when Aiden and Michael were together. There's some people that there's some couples that you see and you're like, mm, they're not going to last. They're going to break up in a year or so, or they're just mm -hmm. not right for each other. And then there are couples that you're like, they're perfect for each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to quote Sylvester Stallone from Rocky, but, they fell in each other's gaps. And that's what yeah. Aiden, Aiden and Michael did for each other. And you could Aww. tell they were just, they weren't, they weren't uh, necessarily joined at the hip, but they were, uh, there was an energy in the room between them. And you could just tell these two were met, destined to be together. Yeah. Yeah. And we were joined at the hip actually. Cause he, you know what he was doing, even though we were apart, he would, what he would do is he would check out the room and yeah. make sure everything was was filled in he was looking for audience reactions and actually monitoring what the room temperature was like while i was needing to do the work of the producer right right was seemed like just a regular audience member but he was actually looking out for me in a big way and he really had my back he really had my back mm -hmm. um it, and i and i can say you know we were truly truly in love it was amazing, an incredible experience. Yeah, it was palpable if you were in the room with both of you. Yeah, yeah, really loved him. And then he dies, and what do you do? Um, you know, you. What did you do? After, I, I first of all, I became suicidal. I didn't want to live. And then I decided that okay, like I can't kill myself. I don't think I can actually do that mainly at that time for my family. And I was like, okay, I'll stay alive, but I'm not gonna stay alive feeling this way. I can't feel like this every day. It feels too bad. I have to figure out a way to feel better because this is not, I can't, mm -hmm. I, it, I couldn't, it, it hurt way too much. Right. And so I was like, I'm gonna stay, but I'm gonna figure out a way to be happy being here. Otherwise it's, I, I can't. So then what I started doing was researching how I can go for the, the, the result, the goal of an emotional end. So for those 14 years, I went for producing. I went for, you know, winning the audience over. I went for money. I went for success or what have you. And now what I tried to do was use those tools that I gathered to an emotional result, right? So how do I use that so that I can be happier? What is being happier? How do I get out of that? Like, what, what can I do? 
And so then the result, the goal became emotional, not tangible, um, mm -hmm. out of sheer desperation, right? And when I started doing that, that's when the art of being yay came about because my life changed. Mm -hmm. it completely shifted everything in my life mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a big, big way. And I'm so happy to be able to share that in the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, is yay, um, is yay an acronym? Is that, is that a... An acronym is there? Is it, is it a uh, why? Does Y stand for something? A stand for something? Why stand for something? Or? No. <laughs> what yay! I wanted to. I wanted to write the book. I wanted to call it the art of being gay because I, I I'm gay. Yeah. And I that was fun, but it was pointed out to me that you know it's kind of limiting, um, and you don't want people to have an idea. So so I changed it to gay. But the thing is, like, it actually lines up with me well because people look at me and they think I'm yay. They, 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 yay is a, something that they would use to describe me, if mm -hmm. you ever, you know. Um, and so it worked out perfect. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you have been described as the gayest man on earth. I can't believe somebody said that to your face, but uh, apparently somebody did. I am actually not the gayest man on earth. Uh, if you think I'm the gayest man on earth. I didn't think so, but apparently somebody did. Oh, my God, I am not. That. <laughs> no, no, I was from Brent's, but uh, yeah, Brent. No, I don't know. I, I, I but uh, how did you get Margaret Cho to do the uh, to do the forward? I asked her. Huh? Oh, right, I'll do it. Open for her a couple times, um, and I've been on shows with her, and we have the connection, you know. And um, yeah, I was gonna say, how far back do you go with uh, Margaret? A couple years. Um, and what's so cool is when I first moved to the United States, it was 1994 and she had her own show, All American Girl in 1994. Right. And she was the first Asian person that I saw on television on my primetime TV in 1994. And I remember thinking how With cool. Dial and, yeah. So for me to have a foreword from her and her stamp of approval on this project is it means the world. It's so amazing. Yeah. I mean, she's got to be a hero of yours. Yeah, she really is. And yeah. uh, I, I met her a couple of times. She's very nice. And uh, but I don't think she would do the forward for my book. But I'm glad she did the forward for your book. Oh so, well, uh, you don't know that. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens. But um, but the art of being gay. I think we, everybody could, uh, should be gay. And now uh, this is a good expansion for you because now uh, you're you're uh, bringing this to offices, to corporate the corporate world. Yeah. And you you're not going to stop till everybody's gay like you. Yeah, because everybody wants to be happier, right? Yeah, agreed. So everybody, everybody wants to be happier. And we, okay, so when I started researching this, how to be happier, I took the approach that the world would have you take initially, um, and, and it failed to... A, a, a tremendous degree. It was it was really really terrible. So what happened was after Michael died, I was like I got to be happier. Oh, you know what? And then I sold myself on the story. I was like, this is my opportunity to really make a life that I really want. So you know what? I'm gonna exercise. I'm gonna go and do comedy like like seven you know eight times a day or whatever. I'm yeah. gonna meet up with friends um, and, and surround myself with community and all these external answers for how to feel better, right? Like you're supposed to get together with friends and call your friends all, all the time and hang out, you know, and I even like, you know, went on dates, which is ridiculous. And, um, you know, eat nice foods, treat yourself well, go for a long walk on the beach, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. All of that completely blew up in my face, utterly. Because what it was, was a pushing against a negative emotion, essentially. So I would be feeling negative emotion and, I'm, and I, all these things are supposed to help me get away from this. If I fix this, then I won't feel this. And that is the traditional approach to happiness that everybody would have you take. Everybody will tell you, what do you want? Oh, maybe you can get inspired about your career. Maybe you can get, you know, I don't know, in a relationship or whatever. So we all wait for this to change. But actually that has very little to do with your happiness level and what you ultimately want. So that's what I really discovered in a big, big way and how you can really take charge of your own emotional um, condition. You can take charge of it. You can incrementally increase your internal happiness thermostat that it's at a certain level. 
Then what happens is everybody around you freaking notices. Then they go, I want to work with you. Will you go out with me? Will you be my friend? Will you, will you, will you? And things line up as a result of your happy energy that you're carrying with you, not the other way around. You right. get what I'm saying? No, no yeah, you, you're going from the outside in and you really need yeah. to go from the inside out. You have to, if you want to make change uh, to your happiness level. Okay, Hannah. Yeah. Uh, Hannah. <laughs> I, I'm just l taking notes and listening and learning because I definitely need to and do been, as you say. Yeah. <laughs> I would say you've been, you've been happier lately though, Hannah, because uh, um, not just because you got a, a new boyfriend, but I think, uh, I think uh, something happened inside of you that attracted that and other things that have been going good in your life. Yeah, you know, I kind of, because of this whole like pandemic thing, I kind of stepped out of like my comfort zone where I'm like, no, I only hide at night because I have a health condition. I don't like going out during the day. But now I'm pushed to go to the beach with my, my best friend and my boyfriend. I'm learning to bodyboard and just getting more confident. Yeah, it's wonderful, you know? Mm -hmm. that's, that's good. So you're feeling more yay these days, Hannah. I, yeah, you know what? I am, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so Aiden, uh, I, Problems <laughs> that you face that cause you the unhappiness it, it has to be resolved. Yeah. It will not be ignored. It will not be ignored with an answer outside. It yeah. must be resolved, looked at directly, and resolved. Yeah. And Hannah, also, if you want to, uh, if you want to just smile, I, I recommend. Uh, although you know, it's a bit a few years ago, but Aiden had a, a YouTube series, uh, "My Life on the F List." Yeah, that's right. Oh, I what I it was very funny, but yeah. you describe yourself as an untalented comedian, which is absolutely. Could be further from the truth. Well, it was well, it was for the show. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know you're taking off on a. It was a takeoff of Kathy Griffin, who was who was hardly on the D list yeah. herself. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, but it, it, it's very funny. So yeah, so there's a lot of YouTube stuff you got to check out, Hannah. You got to check out the stand up. You got to check out the F list. You got to check out uh, also him singing more than a feeling and. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> that first. Uh, Yep. And uh, take off of uh, We Will Rock You at the Ice House. A lot of stuff. But uh -huh. Aiden, when was the last time you were on stage in front of a crowd? Uh, I, was, I went to Montana like a month and a half ago. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And that was the first time in like three months or six months? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was awesome. I really loved it. Yeah, you went with Angie and uh, yeah, it was, it's, it's so different than the, than the Zoom shows and the, you know. Oh, you yeah. Know, yeah. I I love it. I love stand-up comedy. <sighs> and in and, and, and Montana, you, you know, you, you would think it'd be too conservative for you, but they, they must love you out there. They're, that, yeah, I, I have found in my personal experience that people don't care. <laughs> if, you approach with the attitude, if you approach with the attitude, when I do, I do stand-up comedy at, you know, at all kinds of small towns, right? If I approach with the attitude of, hey, you paid for a ticket, we're here to have fun. I'm not here to change your beliefs on anything. I just want us to have fun while we're here, okay? They want to have fun. We have a common goal. We want to have fun. And so they really don't care, in my experience. As long as you're funny, they don't care. They do not care, yeah. And if you build rapport, that's it. If yeah. you build rapport, that's... <laughs> Like, I mean, I've had guys with like literally Confederate flags on them come up to me after the show, shake my hand and go, well, I've never seen a gay Asian before, but you know, I really, I really, I really like that. I really like that. This is my girlfriend, my girlfriend, you know? And, uh, and it, it was, uh, it, w it was an interesting moment, you know? Like. It's so weird. It's so weird to be in a town where they've never seen a, great, a gay Asian. I, I can't even fathom it, but. I've always lived in big cities my whole life. Well, I was in Sanford, Florida, actually, where the Trayvon Martin thing happened, and I played bonkers. Mm. And I was in the bathroom, and after the show, I was in a stall, and I heard these two guys talking by the urinal. And I heard this. This one guy said, yeah, you know, we don't... And they were all white. They were all white at me. And I heard him say, you know, we don't have a lot of diversity around here. You know, a, a gay Asian would do it. And I just thought that was a sweet moment, even though, even though, you know, it was very, 
general or generalized or what, whatever. That's how you start kind of making some movement, right? Like you, they see me as a person, maybe not just something that they see on TV, right? And so, they wouldn't mind you, they wouldn't mind you move, uh, moving in next summer, which is great. Yeah, I thought it was sweet. It is sweet. <laughs> and that, that's actually, and where does the time go? That's actually a good, a good point to end on. Although yeah. we'd love to have you back. I, I think Hannah would love to have you back every week. But... Hannah, keep in touch with me, huh? You can send a Facebook message or whatever. Oh, definitely will. Uh, hey, say what you just said because uh, you kind of faded out. Huh, I fa oh, I said I definitely will. I'm going to keep in touch. Yeah. Well, I think you said you loved Hayden, which, uh, which I think we both do. Oh, of Thanks. course. Yeah. So, but I definitely, I encourage everybody who's been listening to this to go to Amazon or go to your local bookstore, support your local bookstore, uh, or where, you know, Barnes and Noble or wherever, and get The Art of Being Yay by Aiden Park. That's A-I-D-A-N Park. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the last question I have for you, because I forgot to ask this before. Yeah. Why did you change your name and why Aiden? Oh, um, I was joining SAG, Screen Actors Guild, you know. And I was so sick of people uh, uh, spelling my name wrong at Starbucks, Sung Min Park, they couldn't do it. And so I was literally like, I was like, I'm changing my name. And then I changed my name to Aiden and then spelled it wrong. It's A-I-D-E-N. And I spelled it A-I-D-A-N and it's an Irish name. So, you know, there you go, the joke's on me. <laughs> it's a cute <laughs> name though. I, I think it's a, I like it. <laughs> I like it too. Was there a specific Aiden you had in mind? I'm sorry? Was there a specific Aiden you had in mind? No, I just wanted, I just wanted to be the first letter. I knew I wanted to be the first A, you know? Ah. And I thought I had a lot of energy back then. So I was like, okay, well, Aiden seems like a, a fitting name. It seems like an, a name of an energetic young man. Yes. Yeah. Thank well, you, You still have that energy. You still have the yay. And anybody listening, and we have quite a depressed crew out there, if you want to, if you want to get some positive power in your life and really uh, get some good advice and an amazing life story yeah. uh, that's not even halfway done. I could just imagine what, this, what your second book will be. May I plug mm -hmm. some? Can I plug something real fast? Well, plug, plug everything you want. Plug away. So the art of being yay, at the end of each chapter, there's a QR code that you flash and it leads you to my site where I have a 12 minute accompanying video that explains the concept of each chapter that I talk about. Right? Oh, about wow. Be happier. And so if you don't have access to save money or whatever, you can just go to my site, Aiden Park, A-I-D-A-N-P-A-R-K.com, where there are resources. There's blog posts about inspiration and how to make yourself happier and ha what happiness is all about. There is also a, a values evaluation worksheet where you can take a look at your values and see how you're doing and living in alignment with that. You know, there's all kinds of videos and resources. So, and it's all available for free. So please mm -hmm. just go to my site and check it out um, if you want to feel better, but you can't get access to the book for whatever reason. You know, it's, I just mm -hmm. want happiness. So, so yeah. go to AidenPark.com and buy the book. And, uh, and I got to tell you, you're, you're much less creepy than Tony Robbins. So definitely. Uh, am I? I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, he's got the big head and the weird voice. I don't know. I'm not, I, he, he's got some good stuff, but he just, he, I always thought he was, he, he doesn't look human. There's something weird about him. Oh, I think he's a wonderful man. No, I, he, he is, but he is, yeah, he's just, uh, he just, there's something off-putting. Like there's something that I just can't put my finger on. I, 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 he's just too big, I think. To me, it seems like he's uh, the, the main problem, like you said, right? The, why is this different than, than other empowerment books? Because um, there's an untouchability to a lot of those guys who present material, like right. you can change your life. It's like almost they're untouchable and I'm touchable. Yes, you, you, can, can, you can touch Aiden. You can touch me all you want, please. I've touched you before. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> AidenPark.com. Get the art of being a Aiden. This has been such a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you, well, Thank you so much. Hannah? Yes. And follow Aiden on social media and uh, uh, what's your what's your Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all that? Aiden Park Show, A I D A N P A R K Show, Aiden Park Show. Aiden Park Show on social media. Mm -hmm. Hey Hannah Box six 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 on Instagram and also Talk. check out our other show, Vegans. It was Vegans Unlimited. Vegans Uncensored. 
Vegans Uncensored. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean I didn't mean to mess that up. Vegans Uncensored. <laughs> that's also also on all social media. Dark Mark Show and Goth Comedian on all social media. Everybody, have a wonderfully yay week. Bye, Bye. guys. Bye.